Pacific Judicial Conference begins in Port Moresby. Simbu Hydro Power Project given green light. And Kerama MP calls for investigation. This is National MTV News with Helen Sayer. Good evening and welcome to Monday's news. The Pacific Judicial Conference began today in Port Moresby. It is a biannual event which runs for four days and the theme for this year is enhancing the quality of justice in the Pacific. This high-level regional forum is attended by chief justices and judges from all over the Pacific Islands. Invited guests and dignitaries were given a rousing welcome by POM grammar students at the International Convention Center this morning. Prime Minister Peter O'Neill, who gave the opening remarks, spoke about the demanding role of the judiciary in Papua New Guinea and the survival of democracy through the rule of law. The PM encouraged four Pacific Islands to have a competent judicial system in ensuring regional stability. Able to now, of course, enhance our democratic principles, the role of courts, the role of the executive government, the role of parliament, and the role of public service. That is the minimum basic principles of survival of democracy in any country. The conference he is hosted by Chief Justice Sir Salabo Injia. Chief Justices and judges in the Pacific Island countries have come together to discuss issues to promote and improve the justice system. These include strengthening judicial leadership, access to justice, building the competence and professionalization of courts, and improving court service delivery. Today, Sir Salamo presented a paper on the quality of justice in the Pacific. He would like to see a new judicial case management system to produce courts effectively. He said the current one proved to be ineffective because the court registrar takes control of cases and he assigns cases to judges. A new system called case docketing is a hands-on approach which allows judges to take control of cases. The judge takes control of the case from when the case is filed to its disposition. And the judge must account for that case. If there's a delay, that judge will answer for it. The chief justice will ensure that happens. It requires a whole new case management system. The participating countries are PNG, Australia, New Zealand, Solomon Islands, USA, and other smaller Pacific Island countries. Some big topics that will be discussed are the use of modern technology to announce quality, public dissemination of court information and judgments through the media, and separation of powers and judicial independence. Fasinata Yama, National MTV News. Meanwhile, opposition leader Don Pollier has welcomed the chief justices and judges who are in the country to attend the Pacific Island Conference. He encouraged the PNG judiciary to learn from both Australia and New Zealand, including smaller island states, on how to deal with issues such as the backlog of cases and maintaining the independence of the judiciary. He said PNG's justice system must be protected at all times as it is the only avenue for citizens to seek justice. The Gamborg Hydropower Project has been given the green light by the Conservation Environment Protection Agency. Member for Kundiawa Gamborg and Minister for Tourism was at the SIPA office today to receive the environment permit today. The project is a public-private partnership that aims to not only generate electricity but also economic benefits for the people in the area. SIPA Managing Director Gunther Joku said their assessment focused on whether or not landowners were supportive of the project and if there will be any impact on the environment. Some of the things we look at also are uh, environmental flows, uh, make sure that uh, if there is any diversion of water, and in this case there will be some diversion of water, there is uh, enough water left in the streams to sustain um, environmental habitats and so forth in the, in the river system. 
uh, obviously, and uh, from our experience uh, in dealing with hydropower project, water is used to generate electricity or run the turbines, and it's put back into the water uh, river channel itself again, uh, further downstream. So we make sure that the water intake and the water that is put back into the system uh, continues to uh, behave in a way that does not affect the environment. Member for Kundiawa Gambog, Tobias Kulang, said this project is an investment that the district has made in partnership with PNG Hydropower, a private company. He said the only thing left to be done before construction begins is to sign a power purchase agreement with PNG Power. So once that is guaranteed, uh, uh, granted, uh, we're looking at a construction period of 20 months to bring on board uh, 6 to 12 megawatts of power. Uh, to uh, onto a uh, PNG power grid. Minister Kulang said it will cost 72 million kina to build the initial phase of the hydro plant, which will generate 6 to 12 megawatts of electricity. He said impacted landowners will benefit from both equity shares and royalty payments. The district is going to all shares also in the company. Okay, the district has spent DSIP money to. Uh, like you saw Richard Murrow asking, where have all the economic uh, uh, component of the DSLP has gone? Kunja Gembok district has spent its one million every year in this particular project. Uh. Sarah Aupong, National MTV News. Rival factions representing landowners of Oktedi Mine in Western Province have been called on to put aside their differences and work together for the benefit of the people. Today, landowners representing mine villages and CMCA communities made this call for unity following comments from rival landowner factions calling on the national government not to recognize them. In the August Parliament sitting, Prime Minister Peter O'Neill announced that government had resolved to transfer 33% shareholding in Octedi Mining Limited to landowners of Western Province. This decision was on the back of continuous negotiations between the landowners and government regarding benefits from Octedi Mine. The landowner group that had been at the forefront of these negotiations had been Mount Fubilan Resource Association together with CMCA communities. Leaders from these two organizations spoke to MTV over what they claimed was the hijacking of this process by another faction led by Octedi Mine Impacted Area Association Chairman Nick Boon. Mr. Boon had been critical of the national government's recognition of MFRA and CMCA in transferring these shares. We had the federal approach the government, we had mine landowners and the CMCA leaders, and we had the core leaders that negotiated this. Uh, we don't know where they're coming from, but they should respect. In anything that we want to pursue, it has to come to a recognized leadership. And it all goes back to the mandate. These landowners support the government's decision to transfer shares in Octedi back to the people of Western Province and have taken steps to prepare for when this share transfer is complete. The mine villages have spoken of how they want that 9% to be managed. So we are in the process of getting the business in order. Therefore, they must respect the decisions of the mine villages and wait until we discuss well of the outcome that will benefit the, benef the beneficiaries or the shareholders of the mine villages. These landowners are now calling on the government to proceed with the share transfers. But more importantly, for all landowner factions to work together for the common good of the people of Western Province. He recognized this group from the beginning, which we have a copy of the recognition and he stood, remain with this group, because this group is the general group. I also take this time to tell other functions, the more we argue ourselves, we'll not get anywhere. Let's just join hands, work together for the betterment of the people. Merbatulo, National MTV News. 
Kerma MP Richard Mendani has called for an inquiry into funds allocated for projects in the Gulf province. Mendani backed recent statements by Prime Minister Peter O'Neill on the lack of development in Gulf. The member called on the Prime Minister and Deputy Prime Minister Sir Leo Dion to conduct an investigation into the books of the Gulf provincial government. The Kerama MP made a statement this afternoon supporting the recent calls made by Prime Minister Peter O'Neill when he visited Gulf capital last week Tuesday. Despite acknowledging the road to development, the no, Prime no, Minister no. sounded warning bells to the Gulf Even. provincial government questioning the whereabouts of funds earmarked for major roads. projects such as the S-Trip upgrade and roads in Kerama town. We made sure that we reseal the airport. We tried to reseal the township. I'm very disappointed that, that the uh, fully funds that were made available has not been fully spent here. I will find out why. I will find out why. In his statement today, the Kerama MP Richard Mendani alleged that the funds granted for Kerama District or Gulf for that matter have been abused by the Gulf provincial government. Mendani said no feasible development is taking place in Kerama town. And what the Prime Minister is witnessing on the ground is basically a mismanagement of a lot of all these funds. The Kerama MP wants a quick response by the Prime Minister, stating people want constructive development agendas as most of the projects that is ongoing is not budgeted for. And it is independent on the Prime Minister and the Deputy Prime Minister who is responsible, minister, who is the minister responsible, provincial and, and allied local level government to start issuing instructions to make that, that the situation in the district and the province is corrected. We are MP Mendani said people have suffered enough and the abuse of power must stop as Gulf prepares to host the next LNG project in the country. Hopefully the governor who is the, the, the head of the department of Gulf and all the, and all the directors of the provincial government now they are able to go back and rectify some of the situation and hopefully work with myself and member for Kikori and, uh, and address some of the problems in the province. Jack Lapave, Jr., National MTV News. Lay City is preparing for the independent celebrations this Friday as Papua New Guinea gears for the 41st independent celebrations this week. Various provincial flags are flying throughout the city with special attention to roundabouts. Not many big celebrations in the last six months, but in September, the colours have come out. Lay City is a melting pot of cultures and languages, a meeting place of people from various parts of the country. It's here that you can catch a bus and travel by road to seven provinces. That's one third of the country. Like many other parts of the country, the people of Morabe will find every reason to celebrate their province of residence and their province of origin. The provincial government has taken a bit more care in preparing the city for the 41st anniversary. The flags have gone up at the snack bar roundabout. Each province represented. The schools are preparing in a big way for this Friday. For some, it hasn't been a good year. The diversity and the differences in ethnicity sometimes becoming an excuse for the violence that happens in this province. But maybe, just maybe, when the country turns 41 on Friday, just like many of its citizens, people will look at their differences as a blessing and something they can be proud of. Scott Wyde, National MTV News, Lay. Among stories after the break, one woman's worldwide campaign on violence against women. Stay with us. Welcome back. An Australian gender-based violence campaigner and survivor is embarking on a fundraising campaign called the Project BRA, which stands for Beach Run for Awareness. Claire McFarlane will run 16 kilometers on beaches in 184 countries around the world to raise money for charities involved in dealing with rape victims. She flew into PNG last Thursday and started her 16-kilometer beach run over the weekend. Claire McFellan was only 21 when she was brutally raped in Paris. Her battle for justice took her 16 years. The ordeal could have driven the South African-born McFellan to the depths of despair. 
but instead she turned to running paths along sandy beaches around the world to raise awareness for rape survivors. I've actually already started. I started on the 18th of July this year. Um, the date has a specific importance. Um, I'm a survivor. I'm a survivor of rape. I was very violently raped and almost murdered in Paris in 1999. And um, the 18th of July was the anniversary of my attack. So that's when I started in South Africa. In Port Moresby, the 37-year-old started a 16-kilometer run on Saturday at dawn at the harbour side West Denley Esplanade with a good number of other supporters, including U.S. Ambassador to PNG, Katrine Herbert Gray. We join you here today, Claire, to lend our voices to support the survivors of rape and remove the taboo about speaking about it. We join you today to help raise funds for healing programs starting right here in Papua New Guinea. McFillan's aim is to raise awareness and funds to help survivors of rape with the healing process in every single country she ran and to empower survivors of rape by openly sharing her own story. I can sense here in PNG that there's a deep desire for change and uh, that people want to start healing and, and being able to speak out and, and break their silence. Uh, so I, I encourage um, survivors of, of sexual violence to do that and, um, and just to look after themselves. McFillan is the first person and woman in the world to attempt this global run, representing 80% of the world's countries and over 3,000 kilometers of beach. You know, I've just been um, so uh, happy and, and touched by how many people wanted to be here and walk, run, cheer me on, um, women, men, children, incredible. In support of uh, Claire McFarlane, she's uh, doing this global awareness campaign around the world, running 16 kilometers of beach. 50% of the sales will go directly to the project BRA.org fund, which is 100% charitable. The other 50% will be used to finance the t-shirts and the run. The vision is to create a self-sustaining, ongoing campaign and from 2020, once the beach run is completed, to host an annual global beach run. Shane Saroya, National MTV News. The European Union has launched the 2016 to 2020 Human Rights and Democracy Country Strategy for Papua New Guinea. The strategy identifies three priority areas which the EU, jointly with France and United Kingdom, will pursue in PNG. These are to promote a human rights culture in PNG society, support the ratification and implementation of human rights, international conventions and instruments, and strengthen good governance, democracy and rule of law. The main activities to drive the strategy will be financed under the European Instrument for Human Rights and Democracy, other relevant financing instruments and through targeted public diplomacy. With Papua New Guinea's national elections fast approaching, the media has been encouraged to ensure that it carries out its role of informing, educating and creating healthy debate without fear or favor. Deputy Head of Mission for the United States Embassy in Papua New Guinea, Joe Mabry, made these comments when speaking on the role of media in the current U.S. presidential elections. Drawing from his experience as a journalist, Mabry said there were important lessons that the media in PNG could learn from the U.S. in election reporting. The United States is in the middle of its presidential elections, and the media attention surrounding this election has intrigued people from all over the world. In fact, much of the hype surrounding this election has been spurred on by the amount of media coverage by U.S. media. Speaking at a discussion on the role of media in U.S. elections, United States Deputy Head of Mission to Papua New Guinea, Joel Mabry, spoke of some of the roles of media in its elections. The media in the United States has lessons it's learning itself uh, from past uh, election campaigns and election results and so forth. In other words, uh, it's not a perfect machine. Uh, I think we have a strong uh, media in many ways, uh, media that is uh, independent or at least tries to be independent, but we also have media that have that belongs to interest groups uh, that is maybe trying to set the agenda and that is a traditional role of, of the media as well. So Lessons from the U.S. can also be passed on to local media here in Papua New Guinea. And according to Mabry, the U.S. Embassy is looking to facilitate this transfer of knowledge. 
This will begin with the U.S. presidential debate later this month. Uh, and around those uh, events, the debates, uh, we will try to organize events for, to give our Papua New Guinea friends an opportunity to watch with us and debate with us uh, some of the uh, issues, uh, the candidates, and try to understand who is making the better case to be future president of the United States. In less than a year, Papua New Guinea will also be conducting its own elections. And just like in the U.S., the role of media will be crucial with the media to play the role of informing, educating and creating debate on issues of national importance. Papua New Guinea has its elections in mid-2017. We know that our friends in Papua New Guinea are also beginning to focus a lot on campaigns, on who they're going to support and so on. So this is a very timely set of discussions. Today's uh, discussion uh, was focused on the coverage of elections by the media. And I, as a former journalist, I felt that was a particularly important topic to address with the audience. The role of media is always evolving, where it was once the only source. Information on elections is now also available from other mediums, among them social media. This is something that traditional media will have to deal with, as there is a trend that looks towards other mediums for information. Whether you're in the United States or in Papua New Guinea, uh, it is important to remember that the media does play a role. Is it the only source of information? No. There are other sources that people can, can find, political parties, the candidates' offices themselves, uh, blogs, and so on. But uh, I would say that the United States has some very strong media institutions and traditions. Uh, Mirabatulo, National MTV News. Officials from the University of Natural Resources and Environment today welcomed new Vice Chancellor Professor John Warren and his wife Dr. Catherine. The pair was welcomed by the Chief of Staff of the Office of the Prime Minister George Bopi and representatives from the university. Professor Warren joins UNRI from Eberist with University in the United Kingdom. Professor John Warren arrived in the country this morning to a small welcome ceremony at the Jackson's International Airport, led by the Chief of Staff of the Prime Minister's Office, George Bopi. Professor Warren's appointment as Vice-Chancellor of the PNG UNRE was endorsed by the National Executive Council on April 4, 2016. This was done through the Higher Education Provisions Act of 2014. His contract is for three years. Sincerely thank uh, Professor Warren and his good wife, Dr. Catherine, for leaving their comforts of their home back in the United Kingdom and to be able to come. Professor Warren has a Bachelor of Science with Honours in Plant Biology, a Doctorate in Biology, and a Postgraduate Certificate in Teaching in Higher Education. He said because the world is faced with the uncertainties of climate change, it was an exciting time to be working with agriculture and food production. The way to address that, I believe, it is built on diversity. And one thing that Papua New Guinea is rightly proud of is its diversity. Diversity is more productive and it's more sustainable, it's more robust. I want to come in and learn from your diversity, learn what, what works, uh, and learn what's more successful and what's less successful. The appointment of the new vice chancellor is a way forward for the university, whose image has been marred by recent student unrest and allegations against the former vice chancellor. We just thank you, Professor uh, John Warren, and uh, your uh, Dr. Kathleen Warren, for joining us. Tomorrow, Professor Warren is expected to meet with the Prime Minister as well as pay a courtesy call to the British High Commission. He is also scheduled to visit the University of Papua New Guinea as well as the Pacific Adventist University. An official handover takeover ceremony will take place at the university on the 19th of this month. Deli Waigeno, National MTV News. 
Golala District in Central Province is on a mission to revitalize agriculture activities in its communities. Recently, the district launched an agriculture project site to farm bulb onions and English potatoes. Golala MP William Sam says despite freight being a challenge, the district will get help from state agencies to overcome this obstacle and help farmers sell their produce. This piece of land was handed over to the Goilala District Administration for a trial farming project. Locals believe the help of the district and relevant state agencies will help farmers work the land and earn a regular income. So we have a lot of land now. So people can come past and see the knives and cut them. Farming is not new to the Golala people, however, a rapid decline in support over the past 25 years saw no proper roads built to help farmers bring their produce to the market. Agriculture expert Michael Atuai will be giving technical help to farmers with the support from the Fresh Produce Development Agency. He says apart from bulb onion and English potato, anything can be farmed as Goilala as rich fertile soil. However, the challenge lies with the transportation of the garden produce to markets to sell. The biggest killer for us here is uh, transportation and transport is the biggest cost in any agricultural production activity. So we are looking at ways in which we could sustain that uh, or assist in making it workable within Goilala district. Golala MP William Samp, who is behind the drive to support farmers and implement this project, says the whole idea is to seek outside knowledge and create a systematic income for local farmers. Fresh produce have advised us to not to venture into perishable uh, crops first, but to do English potato and bulb onion so that uh, they will, uh, uh, when there's uh, transport problems, they can last. MP Semp says buyers will operate in Goilala to address the freight challenges that has lingered over the past 25 years. Open for uh, uh, agricultural demonstration activities here. Hip -hip. Hip -hip. Hip -hip. Hip -hip. Hip -hip. Junior National, MTV News. And now looking at our finance news, the Kina closed unchanged at 0.3155 US dollars in the interbank market. At Bank South Pacific, your Kina was buying 0.3080 US dollars, 0.4058 Australian dollars, 0.2711 Euro and 31.18 Japanese yen. Looking at commodity prices at New York close, Gold, coffee and cocoa closed lower, while copra closed the day unchanged. Palm oil, crude oil and copper all closed the day lower. And on the stock market, the Dow Jones closed at 394.46 points lower. The ASX is trading at 117.08 points lower. And the All Ordinaries is trading at 119.55 points lower. You're with National MTV News. More stories after the break. Welcome back to the news. More funding is needed to host the 2016 Hiri Moale Festival. Chairman of Motukoita Council Assembly Apoa Udia made this statement today when receiving a timely assistance from the central provincial government. Chairman Udia said for the first time, Motukoi Tabuans will join hands with the central people to celebrate the crowning of the Hiri Queen come October 1st. Speaking today at the news conference, Motukoita Council Chairman Apo Hwada said more financial assistance is needed to host this major event celebrated by people from the Motukoita book clans. However, for this year, central villages will also take part to see the crowning of the 2016 Iri Queen. We have left our people out in the organization and I thought uh, uh, it was time that uh, we should extend the invitation to our, our neighboring villages, uh, Motukotabu villages. It was a special occasion this morning as organizers of the festival met with Central Provincial Governor Kila Hauda and his administration. Talks have concluded with Central Provincial Government putting its hand up to fund the canoe racing activity with 100,000 kina. 
this uh, we should be all proud of our customs and our heritage and our past. And we, as leaders now, must ensure that these customs must be passed on to our people. And this is one avenue of doing it. And I am quite pleased that we are all going to work together on this endeavor. The inclusion of central communities is said to bring together the two Papuan groups who have disconnected in the past 25 years because of land boundary. This year's Irimuale festival will be a two-day event at Port Mosby's Ella Beach waterfront. Hopefully it should be a very colorful day over the water on day one. And uh, we will have ANC great uh, canoe racing. Uh, day two is reserved for the crowning of the Hiri Hanenama. So far, National Capital District Commission, Lay Biscuit and Exxon Mobil have thrown their support behind the staging of this event. Jagla Pave Jr. National, MTV News. Young Women's Christian Association General Secretary Dame Kila Amini said PNG needed to choose an attire that reflects our national identity. She said this when commemorating a long-standing YWCA tradition, the Toana Night Fundraising Dinner on Friday. The Port Mosby YWCA has pioneered and continues to promote Toana as part of PNG cultural national identity promotion since pre-independence. Dame Kila Amini said it saddened her that well after gaining independence, PNG still did not have a national traditional outfit to show off. She recalled attending international YWCA meetings overseas and having to feel out of place among almost every other national representatives dressed in their elegant national attires. Being a center dedicated to empowering women, they were given a voice in this appeal, modeling what they thought was ideal for a national identity. The YWCA has been around since pre-independence and is affiliated with its mother association in London, the UN and the NCDC City Council and churches, to name a few. The association seeks to work alongside the communities and members to develop youth, prison rehabilitation, literacy and women empowerment programs in particular. The Ituana Night Fundraising would go to support these causes as well as refurbish facilities established to accommodate them. Lorraine Gabina, National MTV News. Over 20 participants from Eastern Highlands Province are undergoing the Demographic and Health Survey Provincial Training. The two-week training started today at the Red River Lodge in Goroka. This workshop is part of the nationwide training that is currently being held in 22 provinces to train field personnel who will be going to selected sites to conduct the DHS in their provinces. This is in preparations for the Demographic Health Survey that is conducted by the Population and Social Statistics Division of the National Statistics Office. Meanwhile, the demographic health survey in Lay saw more than 40 health officers being trained on how to analyze and disseminate data. The main objective is to improve the quality of information collected in order to make better decisions. Julie Badui Owa reports from Lay. These health workers will represent Morbe province in a demographic and health survey. One of the objectives of the survey is to provide to the departments of health and planning updated population and health data. Out of the 21 provinces, Morobe has the biggest proportion of teams. Morobe, we have 42 participants. We have six teams, and I think that's the biggest. The demographic health survey will include all citizen households in PNG, both in the rural and urban areas. When coordinating the survey, the interviewers and supervisors will ask three sets of questions. These will include questions on household and separate questions to male and female individuals. We'll be looking at um, family planning, contraception, and um, pregnancy and postnatal care, uh, nutrition, um, domestic violence, and reproduction. The demographic health survey is conducted every 10 years in between censuses. 2006 DHS is the second of such survey conducted in PNG after the first was conducted in 1996. The officers attending the training are given 20 days to comprehend contents of questionnaires before they carry out the actual survey in the field. Julie Badui Owa, National MTV News, Lay. 
The police department has allocated funds to a contractor engaged in building houses at Lays Bumbu Police Barracks to complete the unfinished houses. ACP for Northern Region Peter Guinness said work on the houses was to have begun, but on inspection from our lay team, no work has started yet. Martha Lewis with this report. Guinness is yet to find out why the contractor is yet to begin work. The ACP for Northern Region at this time does not know who the contractor is as well as the amount of money allocated to the firm. Instead, work on the refurbishment of three houses for commissioned officers have already begun. The Bumbu Police Barracks housing program began in 2012 at the cost of 2.5 million kina. The program was initiated to ease the RPNGC housing problem. In April, Police Commissioner Gary Bucky told MTV that the construction was left incomplete as funding was held in a trust account. The department had to transfer the funds to a new account under the modernization funding. Last week, the police commissioner, Gary Bucky, said the funds have been allocated. However, we are now in September and the contractors have yet to begin work. We have allocated funds for the contractor to complete the buildings now. Mata Lewis, National MTV News, Lay. Chukai Sports is next. Our Prime Minister's 13 team name to take on Australia. We'll be back with the details. Chukai Sports. Welcome to Chukai Sports. The PNG Prime Minister's 13 team was named today at the National Football Stadium. The team consists of a good mixture of players from the SB PNG Hunters, the Intercity Cup, and overseas based players. The theme for this year is Stop Violence. Two players from the recently ended National Confederate Championships have been included in the team. Yoks Bagave from the Southern Confederation senior men's team and Muku Peter Kulu from the Southern Confederation under-20 team. Blanda Bavu, Ase Boas, Butler Morris, Justin Olam, Brandy Peter, Wartofopora Jr. and Esau Siune have been picked from the Hunters. Ray Thompson, William Minoga and Rhys Martin have been chosen from the Townsville Blackhawks, while David Mead and Nene McDonald are set to join the team from the Gold Coast Titans. Minister for Sports Justin Chichenko says rugby league in PNG has come a long way in a short period of time and with the recent success of the Kumuls early this year, they will be using it as a boost to take on Australia. Forward to the Australian uh, 13s, uh, PM 13, sorry, coming here and uh, playing at this magnificent national football stadium and, uh, and let's, uh, with the team that's been selected and approved by the Prime Minister, let's uh, move forward and uh, show Australia who we are and uh, how far rugby league's gone in a very short time. They will also be using this to select a team for the 2017 Rugby League World Cup. So, it's a team that builds towards 2017 World Cup. That's why we have the mix here. Uh, from this, I'm told by Coach Michael that end of the year program will extend towards including another 40 boys that will go into camps, three camps over uh, the next two months as we build towards identifying our players for the Hunters and Kumuls into the World Cup. National Gaming Control Board has secured the naming rights of the team. To be actually proud to be um, part of the PM staff in this year as a naming rights sponsor. So on behalf of the, the board of the NGCB, I just want to announce that we are excited and we've been excited since 2014. So. Speaking on behalf of the Prime Minister's office was Chief of Staff George Boppy who says the Prime Minister is excited with the team and is looking forward to the match. Before us, I think we've got a combination of yeah, young people and with a lot of experience and we can see the future of rugby league getting brighter because it's a lot better organised now than it used to be for a long time. So it can only get better for us now and hopefully one day it will unite us as a country and forget about everything else through a sport. So yeah. thank you very much for all of those involved in this. And the Prime Minister is happy to support this all the way through. Thank you. The team will be coached by Michael Marum and assisted by Stanley Teppen. 
Eliza Lavette, National MTV Sports. Papua New Guinea bowed out of the under-20 OFC championship in Port Vila, Vanuatu, despite drawing one all with Fiji over the weekend. De defending champions Fiji needed a point over Papua New Guinea to make the semi-final. However, they fell short of the victory they needed to keep the pressure on New Caledonia in the semi-final hunt. Defending OFC champions Fiji are heading home after they could only manage a one all draw in their match against Papua New Guinea. A free kick from Peter Debinyaba Jr. eluded everyone in the 35th minute to give Papua New Guinea the lead. But Fiji's best player on the day, Franz Vatarongo, Pulled his side level with 20 minutes to play. In a game with plenty of scoring chances, Fijiko's Yodzendra Dat was again left lamenting the ones his side spawned. They missed the chances over excitement or anxious. For Papua New Guinea, who let another winning position slip from their grasp, the point was at least something to show from a frustrating campaign in Port Villa. Thank you, Fiji and Papua New Guinea, for a good football display this afternoon. We played play for our country. Even we didn't make it, but we have to uh, not give our very best for our country. At least we go with a win, or at least a draw. That's why in a, in a, we inspire the boys by you know, telling, them, telling them that, that we have to play for country, the country first. In the Group B matches in Santo, New Zealand and Solomon Islands drew nil all to confirm themselves as first and second in the group respectively. That result eliminated Tahiti, who beat Cook Islands 3-1 in their final match. This means Vanuatu is in the semi-final against Solomon Islands in Port Vila on Tuesday, with the winner claiming a place in next year's FIFA Under-20 World Cup in Korea. New Caledonia also qualified for the semi-finals. and will be travelling to Santo to challenge New Zealand for the other of Oceania's two World Cup tickets. <laughs> Shane Saroya, National MTV Sports. PNG striker Nigel Dabinyaba is set to leave for New Zealand to join the New Zealand Canterbury United Football Club. He is back in Ley with his local team, the Ley Biscuit Football Club, and is expected to leave the country by the end of the month. The 23-year-old arrived back in the country last Thursday after the completion of the National Premier League. Satisfied, he contributed to the club's three straight wins before the end of the competition, despite finishing in eighth place. Dabin Yaba is slowly fulfilling his dream of one day becoming a professional soccer player. He was recently in Australia playing with Western Pride FC where he helped the team win their last three games. He arrived back in the country last week Thursday after his six-week stint with the Pride. The Canterbury United Football Club is a team based in Christchurch, New Zealand and competes in the New Zealand Football Championship, also known as the ASB Premiership, which is New Zealand's top-level football competition. Elijah Lovett, National MTV Sports. True Guy Sports continues after the break. Stay with us. True Kai Sports. Welcome back to True Kai Sports. The National Volleyball Championships kicked off today at the Tarama Aquatic and Indoor Center. 24 men's and 18 women's teams from various associations around the country are taking part in this week-long tournament. PNG Volleyball General Secretary Kila Oli said selections for a junior elite squad will be made during this championship for the Junior Olympics coming next year. Kickstarting the championship were the under-21 in the women's and men's divisions who will head into the elimination rounds tomorrow. And the finals will be played on Wednesday. There's roughly about 64 uh, under-21 uh, uh, teams, 20 in the uh, uh, men's division and uh, 16 in the uh, women's division. A total of 24 men's and 18 women's teams from various associations across the country, including Morobe, Milne Bay and Gulf have come to take part in this week-long tournament. 
Exceptions were made for teams Milmbe and Morobe who are arriving tomorrow. Meanwhile, there will be official formalities on Wednesday when all teams will be present, which will also coincide with the award presentation for the under-21 division and other divisions who will kick off their matches on Thursday. Uh, the PNG Volleyball Federation executives have their own selection panel. Out from this um, tournament, out from this uh, competition, uh, your yeah, elite junior team will be selected to take part at the Olympic uh, junior or under uh, junior uh, tournament uh, uh, later in the year or early next year. So we are planning uh, uh, to um, field a team uh, towards uh, uh, that particular international event as well. Sports Minister Justin Chichenko and NCD Governor Paul Spakop are expected to give their address during the formalities. <laughs> Dini Rostryko, National MTV Sports. And that ends Chukai Sports. Stay tuned for weather details. Chukai Sports. Sports. The weather details are proudly brought to you by Dulux Weather Shield. With doing with Dulux. Your weather forecast for tonight and tomorrow in the southern region, cloudy and likely shower or two in Port Mosby and Kerama, mostly fine in Daru and Popandeta and fine in Alotau. In the Momase region, rain and showers in Leh and a shower or two in Medang, Wiwek and Vanimo. And in the New Guinea Island region, a shower or two in Loringau, Kokopo, Rabal, and Kimbe. Rain showers in Kabiang and mostly fine in Buka. And in the Highlands region, light showers in all centers. The weather details are proudly brought to you by Dulux Weather Shield with Doing with Dulux. Now before we go, recapping our main stories for tonight, Pacific Judicial Conference begins in Port Mosby, Simbu Hydropower Project given green light, and Kerma MP calls for investigation. And that has been the news for Monday the 12th of September 2016. On behalf of the news team, I'm Helen Sayer. Pleasant viewing. Good night.